Hello and welcome to Xena Warrior Podcast. My name is Vera and I'm joined as always by my two fragrant co-hosts. Okay. Katie. That's very appropriate. Yes. Katie. Hi. And Libby. Hi. Today we are talking about episode 310, The Quill is Mightier. Than the sword. I just have to say it every time it's like dot, 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 like teasing around. I'm like, no, then the sword. Finish the damn quill. don't need to finish it because everyone knows what it is. Also, it really should be called the quill is mightier than the fish. Ah, I see. I get it. Then the sword fish. (laughs) Then the sword fish. (laughs) That's it. The mightiest of all. Yep. (laughs) So would you ladies like to begin Yes. Yes, please. Great. <laughs> this episode is written by Hilary Bader and directed by Andrew Merrifield. When have we last seen those two names together, guys? You tell us. Been there, done that. All right. Oh, this is snap. Hilary Bader's second episode uh, and Andrew Merrifield's third episode. He previously directed Gabrielle's Hope at short notice. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what that really means is that these two made their name on Been There, Done That. Right. And yeah. I would say this is a worthy successor. Absolutely. They are in the same like little village, right, as Been There, Done That. I mean, all of the time they're it's in that always. village. It's always. There's but only one little village. I definitely, like, because we spent so many times in the same scene of them coming out of the bar and going through that, like, archway. Mm-hmm. Into the town square. Right, you really know you that. You know that square. area. And that's why it like caught my eye in this. <laughs> <laughs> so great. I'm, I'm glad there's like a, you know, connection. That's Absolutely. Funny. A lot that. of familiar faces and a familiar vibe. Yeah. Why don't we start then? And this episode begins in a very interesting way with some graffiti. Yeah. Ye oldie time graffiti. <laughs> I love, this is a tangent, but I really love ancient graffiti. It's so funny. That's true. It doesn't look like this. No. <laughs> well, I mean, the it helpfully captions what the graffiti Yeah. Is. Oh, man. But like, man, like ancient Roman graffiti and stuff. It's just, it's so funny and dirty and hysterical. <laughs> and it's just people have always been people. Oh, man. Yep. They might not have said Xena's de bomb. No. <laughs> They, da bomb, yeah. The, but the like feeling the same, yeah, yeah, for sure. I loved elect Xena as God. <laughs> that was really good. And like because my brain is always uh trying to think of Game of Thrones things, like that really reminded me of the anti Generis graffiti. That's like right. Misa is our master. Yeah. But in a good way because it's about Xena. I mean it's funny because you don't elect gods. This is a very, like, like democracy is a new thing in ancient Greece. They were punk kids. Yeah. They don't know. <laughs> this felt like very astute political commentary to me. <laughs> well, they're trashing Aphrodite's temple, mm-hmm. and she is very, very pissed. I love the shot of her in this uh, introduction to her being in this episode of her standing in front of the statue of herself that looks exactly the same as her standing there in her... Yeah. Fredericks of Hollywood 90. Right. I love that the statue has the bikini. Yeah. It like matches same, her with yeah. the, the like pink studs. Mm-hmm. She cries, delinquent losers at the kids, and is very like helpless. And then Ares shows up, of course. And we find out that, well, this is an episode that has Ares. So what is he up to now? He's trying to make Aphrodite be mad, not at Xena, but at Gabrielle. Twist! <laughs> mm-hmm. A very, like, stretched, elaborate plot that clearly you're like, well, Lucy's not in this one. I only made the warrior, says Ares. She, meaning Gabrielle, made the legend. Yeah. Which I feel like this is creating a version of this universe that I was not aware of existing, in which Gabrielle is famous for having promoted Zena and made Zena such a powerful cultural force that Mm -hmm. random kids are leaving graffiti on Aphrodite's temple. Well, this reminds me of a comment that we recently received where we, a very long time ago, were like, how does Zena and Gabriel get money? And the comment that we got was, well, it's a big fanon thing that Gabrielle 
goes around in towns and like is saying all her stories and then getting kind of paid for being this traveling bard telling these stories about Xena. So if she's going around telling all these stories and that's how they get money, then like, yeah, at this point they're She's They've been to a lot of places. Yeah. Legend, yeah. yeah. And it makes me very emotional thinking about it. Anyway, go ahead, continue. I think there was an episode that kind of at least started with her just kind of randomly telling a story in a bar or something like that. Yeah, we definitely see her telling people along their, their journey stories of Xena. Those are the only stories she knows, and she loves to talk. So we yeah. can assume that any person she meets, those come out of her mouth. Whether or not she's doing it for money is, I guess, an open question. Mm-hmm. But this episode does seem to confirm that... Through her own work, she is creating the legend of Xena. Yeah. What do you guys think of Ares' Luke here? Because this it's is a peak, new one. This is peak Ares yeah. for me. He's got the big hair. He's got those like facial hair drawn on via Sharpie. <laughs> like it's not. I don't even know intricate. what to call it. Intricate. Yeah, it's intricate. It's, it's like sort of, it's like a cheek, half beard. It's cheekbone. Beard. It's like a bee. <laughs> <laughs> the urd disappeared. The urd is not there. <laughs> And uh, Everdaddy calls him Air. I liked that. That's pretty. I'm going to call him Air from now on. Yeah. Hey, Air. What's up? I love their dynamic. Yes. Yeah. Well, in general, I, I think I already mentioned before that Aries and Aphrodite, their dynamic uh, and rapport is one of the most followed up kind of like relationships. Mm. How would you describe it? Well, they are siblings, right? Right. And, but in an ancient Greek way, according <laughs> to this episode. Well, there's some flirtation, but also a sibling um, kind of yeah. rivalry. But uh, right now, it's more like a flirtation, but it goes into more of like a sibling uh, relationship in an interesting way To me, there's on. definitely a lot of competition. Like, oh, you know, who's more beloved by their supporters? Who actually has, like, yeah. the power? But I, we'll get to it. I, uh, I think I will put a pin in this discussion okay. Okay. towards later on. He does that buzzer sound again. Yes, he does. We oh, thought that was like away. a thing he tried in um, Dirty Six yeah. and just was like, ew, that's not me. But here he is doing it. He's trying to make it work. <laughs> it may never work, but he's trying. He tells Aphrodite that it's Gabrielle and her pesky quill that is the problem. And we do this cut to, you know, our campfire scene between Gabrielle and Zena. And Gabrielle is opening up a fresh new scroll. I love this, how she's talking about it like a book. Everybody who loves books can relate. Everybody who loves books can relate, but anyone who's ever written anything cannot relate. Uh-huh. Like I was like, <laughs> the blank page, the blinking cursor is the scariest thing in the world. That's like, I true. don't know what you're talking about, Gabs. That is not fun <laughs> for But me. what about like people who have to journal or something? You get that fresh new book, that moleskin. Maybe, Maybe journaling is notebook. different. Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, maybe this is the difference between writing fiction and nonfiction. Gabs is just used to filling those pages. Like, it doesn't take any mental effort, really, for her. It just comes out. Yeah. But, like, I see that, and I'm just like, oh, no. Oh, no. I couldn't help but think of Xena looking at that blank scroll being like, this is some perfect TP. <laughs> She's like, oh, I, no. I feel one coming on. How <laughs> can I get in there? <laughs> I love that she was sewing her breastplate. I mean, it's so it sweet and so domestic yeah. that they're both sitting around this campfire and kind of doing their own things, but kind of talking about the things they're doing to each other, which to me is such an old married couple thing to yeah. do. Like, what are you reading, honey? <laughs> oh, I'm just reading the paper, darling. Oh, that's nice. Back to my sewing. <laughs> Zena suggests that Gabrielle try to write something other than you know, stories about Xena. Like, she mm-hmm. wants her to create some OCs in her writing. Why do you think Xena's doing this? She just... <laughs> does she actually feel weird about Gabrielle I, writing about her maybe, all the time? I think so. Wouldn't you? I mean, we did just do the uh, sorting hat quiz mm-hmm. for Xena and decided that she has a lot of humility. Yes. And certainly a person with humility would feel weird about the fact that she has her Boswell sitting next to her all the time being like, and then Xena did something really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that it may, it makes her feel a little strange sometimes, for sure. And also, it's kind of nice to see Zena pushing Gabrielle like into new territory. Like, mm-hmm. Try something new. Like, grow as a writer. 
Get out of your comfort yeah. zone. I do like when people are encouraging of her. Like, Zena is in this episode, and also Joxer is as well. Yeah. Joxer has yeah. some of the nicest things to say about yeah. Gabrielle's writing. We'll put a pin in it till yeah. later, but, like, I really love those moments. Uh, I do just like that this episode positions Gabrielle's barding as important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've talked before about how infrequent you actually have episodes where you get to kind of see how she's doing with that and Mm -hmm. it's always great it's always great to kind of see her at work speaking as a creative person versus Zena who is a non-creative person another slightly Hannah horror vappy (laughs) oh gosh yes oh I love when those come out being Lena Dunham's character in Girls if you don't know so yeah I I immediately have a lot of affection for this episode because I feel like it is it's it's protagonist is Gabrielle as a writer and it's rare Mm -hmm. to have an episode that's about that. Yeah well that's the thing with I think Gabrielle across the show is that it starts very much focused on her as this like person who talks a lot who is the the writer and then we get more into her development uh, in a different way. As a warrior. Yes and it it, um, comes up less so that when then when it does come back, it's very interesting, I think. So yeah. yeah. So it's good to see it highlighted here, especially with the framework of like how she writes about Zena. Is this a moment to bring up the fact that this once again is taking place in the middle of the rift? Yes. Uh, do, do you guys see the rift here? <laughs> no. No. Not so much. Yeah. Though she does immediately write Zena out of existence. I don't think that's entirely Not intentional. Not but Yeah. But it's wait, noticeable. I feel like we have um, some reasoning that we have come up with for this. Well, we were looking up farce because in part, uh, we've been talking on our social media the past week about people's favorite things in Xena versus people's least favorite things in Xena. Mm-hmm. And a few times people have just kind of said outright, like, I don't really like the really silly comedies uh, and have listed a few. Uh, one of which is this episode, Quill is Mightier. And uh, I think I can speak for all of us when I say that we really like this episode. Yeah. Yeah. And we like episodes of this nature, these really silly farce episodes. Yeah. So I, we, we were looking up farces to kind of mm-hmm. get a sense of like what role this plays in human history. Mm-hmm. Like why have farces? So you've got comedy, you've got tragedy, you've got like, you know, bedroom comedy you have all these various kind of genres what's the point of farce Mm -hmm. we were reading about uh the athenian dionysia which you know classical history timely Uh, for our programs you know we're very timely you'd have this grand festival in honor of dionysus in which all the famous playwrights of the time would come and present their work and they were encouraged to present four plays okay. in the competition. Three tragedies okay. and one satyr play. A satyr play is basically the classical form of farce, except it would star satyrs, like okay. doing, doing satyr things. What really was fascinating about this to me is that uh, the placement of the satyr play mm-hmm. during competition, it could either come at the very end, the sort of like, yeah, let's play you out kind of a way, like, let's laugh now. Or it would appear between the second and third tragedies in this trilogy. So if if every playwright is presenting four plays, you have two downers, and then bring in your silly one to kind Uh of put a smile on everyone's face before you wipe it off with a third tragedy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we're looking at where we are in the run of Xena Warrior Princess, which Mm -hmm. is we just had... We've had a whole bunch of tragedies, yep. yeah. but really looking at Deliverer and Gabrielle's Hope and its third episode in the trilogy, which is still to come, this is the period in between those. Yeah. Where we need those sure palate is. cleansers. We're just like, I'm ready to get there. I don't know what you're talking about with all this farce and Seder plays and stuff. But but I think that it's interesting that there actually is a classical model for this, yeah. that people felt that... You know, before you could get to the end, Mm -hmm. like you need to laugh and you need to look at the characters and enjoy kind of their lighter sides. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Really, really cool. It's a reason aside from that (laughs) this is just the way narrative was in the 90s where you'd have 
Like yeah. you're not quite <laughs> where we are today. Uh, continuity. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> totally. It, they were doing this. Yeah, <laughs> obviously. But at the same time, you do feel that the comedies of Xena have a lot of roots in antiquity. You know, Absolutely. You have comedy of Eros. You have these sort of silly sexual, like, body humor mm -hmm. and, you know, just really, like, l lowest common denominator yeah. in a way that you don't This often one especially. See. Yeah. Drunkenness, psych gags, yeah. things like that. Like, it reminds you of Shakespeare. It yeah. reminds you of, like, Roman comedy. It sure. reminds you of classical Greek comedies. So I think this is very much like in the DNA of the show that it's trying to like give you that flavor. Yeah, and I think this one is like really representative of when the show does farce. This is this is peak for me. Peak farce. Yeah, yeah. this one's really good. I love this episode. So it begins kind of with Aphrodite appearing and sitting between Xena and Gabrielle. Mm -hmm. Nobody can see her but us. And she's like, you know, listening to Xena encourage Gabrielle to start writing original stuff. And Gabrielle begins to do so. And as she does so, Aphrodite puts a spell on the scroll. Uh -huh. But I need to point out that I love the way that Aphrodite looks at Gabrielle here. I wrote that down too. Love how Aphrodite is sitting and listening to Gabrielle and looking at her. How would you describe it? into it <laughs> that's how she just seemed very amused by gabrielle mm -hmm. the aphrodite gabrielle relationship in this series could have gone further <laughs> because it was so good yeah it's one of the most surprising and great things yeah I think, this sure. is the first time in the show that they've really had a lot of material together yeah and, and it's nice to see they will have yeah. more yeah so yeah, without actually interacting with Gabs, she just sort of in quietly enchants the scroll mm -hmm. and GTFOs. What has Gabs written in the scroll? So she starts writing about five barbarians showing up and Gabrielle awakes with a jerk. Mm -hmm. She's a lone warrior. Xena has, has gone, gone fishing. fishing. That's right. That's her concession to Xena being like, don't write about me. Like, it's interesting that actually it wasn't Gabrielle's idea to, like, not write about Xena, but Xena's like, no, I don't want to be in this. So Gabrielle quietly writes her out and sends her fishing. She's like, I got to be in America right now. <laughs> yeah. And why does Xena have to be in America right now? <gasps> Greece lightning. Is... Ah! Xena's in America because she's in Greece lightning. That's not the name of it. <laughs> I don't song. know. I don't know. Who I'm on a boat. <laughs> That's why you know. <laughs> She's in Greece playing Rizzo on Broadway. Yeah. Which is very funny. And I have no idea why she's doing this in the middle of Broadway. Yeah, that's Zeta. the question. That's, that's a good question. really strange. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody will tell us, I'm sure. <laughs> so the next morning, everything sort of starts happening as it was written, right? The yeah. barbarians attack. Gabrielle wakes up with a jerk and she's screaming for Xena. But there is no Xena. Well, there's somebody in the bedroll next to her. They can't tell who it and is. And that Xena won't wake up. And she's like, why not? So Gabrielle has to kind of like deal with these barbarians on her own. And she does this in a lot of crazy Xena-esque ways. And Even beyond Xena, though, in the I case would of one way. I agree. Yeah. I would call them quite beyond. The one where she's like spinning at the end of the staff. Yeah. <laughs> we have never seen Xena do anything that, like this. With like just superhuman speed. It's drilling drilled, it into yeah, the ground. Yeah, drilled the staff into the ground. Yeah. And then she also did like the Russian dance. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Vera, what do you, we call that dance? Ooh, the kicky dance. The kicky Russian the, the dance. The Russian kicky dance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Squat kicks. <laughs> Somebody will tell us, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so she did that. And uh, the barbarians are going to attack Xena, quote unquote, uh, in the bedroll. So she has to save her. And she does this back flip. Like, not, it's not, well, she does back flips yeah. to get there. That's important. But then she does this, like, back bend. bend yeah, yeah, back bend. And the sword just cannot penetrate those abs of steel. This was a funny one because we hadn't heard this part of the scroll. Yeah. We didn't know there was a line in there about her deflecting a sword with her abs of steel. Yeah. So it was just it just came as a glorious surprise. You're just like, oh my god, I love that the show is finally calling out the abs. Mm -hmm. 
is it from the show just calling it out by like being around her or is it like a fan thing do you think that it came from i feel came like from fans no matter what anybody says everyone on set everyone in that writer's room obviously everyone in internet chat rooms and message boards must have been obsessed with her abs like everybody was yeah. obsessed with her abs they're so beyond I, like yeah. it's like if anything i'm like what took you so long so, <laughs> for finally calling out the fact that she is so fucking ripped <laughs> yeah it would have been great in during the rift xena was like your abs man <laughs> they're making me feel weird about my body <laughs> <laughs> but then also it's a really weird shot because jock's head is right there yeah they Ooh. did like a uh, hilarious i mean it was it actually gave me kind of body horror vibes because i was like jock's head and just gabrielle's disembodied abs <laughs> <laughs> it was strange. Yeah, yeah, it made me feel weird. I liked her war cry that she did to get there, which was basically a shwai. <laughs> shwai. Yeah. So Gabriel defeats the barbarians. They basically scream, she's too much for us, yeah. and run away. So now Gabriel and Jax are kind of have to logic out why they're in this situation. Like, why is Joxer there? Why have the barbarians attacked? Where's Xena? They end up reading the scroll, trying to understand what happened. And I love that, like, Joxer is so bad at reading. This yeah. is the first yeah. time we've ever seen Joxer read. You can't and read very well. Sounded out the words really carefully. Did she figure it out that the scroll, like, everything that she writes is coming true at the... I mean, obviously everything that she had just done would have been a big tip off, but also that like she wrote like jocks are hitting himself in the face. Right. Well that was She does that after this. Okay. That's well, her testing the theory. The testing the theory. I she feel like the abs line made it be But also just the fact that she kicks of such fury. Yeah, but like literally her abs deflected a sword. That's true. That's that kind is of the, the tip off that yeah. she was not stabbed to death. <laughs> okay. But yeah, she tests it out by writing Joxer hitting himself in the face with her staff, which then happens and she's like, Okay, but I have superpowers. Cool. So she decides that anything is possible now. She can do so much good with this new power. I think at first she's not really thinking of the greater good so much as just like joy riding with it. It's, she's like that kid who found a credit card right now. She's just like, yeah, I can buy anything. But Sweet. her first thought wasn't to make it rain dinars in town. It That's was true. to help these like sisters of Gaia. That's a good point. Yeah. Because we we see, you know, somebody who uses yeah, that credit card for themselves. Yeah, who immediately uses it for personal gain. Gabrielle isn't so much into personal gain, but you do feel like she, you know, she wants to feel good about herself by like making awesome things happen. For people. Yeah. Also, Jocks are reading the scroll. We have the first instance of him reading the part where she wrote, Gabrielle awoke with a jerk. He's reading for evidence of, like, why am I here? I just yeah. woke up here, reads through the whole thing, and it's like, I don't see anything. Yeah. And hopefully, those in the audience realize that awoke with a jerk is what summoned him. It was amazing. It's it, like, I saw people on Wish saying, like, it was funny the first time, but did I really need it reiterated four other times? I think I, it's funny yeah. every time. I think it gets funnier. It is. Yeah. It is, I think, like, such a good pun that, like, you can afford to hear it again. Mm-hmm. And then, like, it builds up the suspense of, like, is Jocks are ever going to realize right. what <laughs> was going on? And there? it's always delivered very well, I find. Yeah. Their comic timing, particularly Renee and Ted, it's always just so perfect. I just love that he is genuinely trying to parse out what is funny about that and what, you know, what is it mean. What's so funny about waking up? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was just so good. So yeah, the sisters of Gaia, whom they happen across, they take care of orphans and they're low on money. Yeah, and they like to sell heirlooms in town to Not get money? Not just heirlooms, but ceremonial swords <laughs> in particular. They run like a hopping business for ceremonial weapons. Yes. And they want to use jocks or scabbard because they take one look at that and they're like, that is totally a ceremonial weapon. Nobody fights with that, which he does not get that joke either. <laughs> oh, I loved his reaction though. I mean, this was one of the better jocks moments where you find out that this is a family heirloom. 
His and dad the, gave yeah, it to him. Yeah, his dad gave it to him. It's like the only thing he ever gave him. Oh, no. He had to get the sword to put in there. Oh, jeez. I had a feel. Well, you have a feeling that probably his dad had this like really awesome, huge, beautiful, jewel-encrusted sword and a scabbard and was like, Jet, here's my sword. Mm. Joxer, here's my scabbard. Jace, He's, go away. So he won't give up the scabbard. And Gabrielle's like, I got this. And she scribbles something down, and suddenly a dude pops out of nowhere and hands them this jewel-encrusted sword. They're like, oh my god, this will feed the orphans for a whole year. (laughs) So this obviously at first looks really awesome. Like, Gabs can just summon out of thin air whatever she needs. World peace. Yeah. Like, if she needs somebody to come with a sword and give it to some orphans, she can just write that down, and there it is. But what she has yet to realize is that there's a larger story attached to that person donating that sword, which we immediately see. He leaves the woods and is like, why did I just give up my sword? Yeah. Yeah. He runs into this other guy. Nathan Lane. Yeah. Yeah. Who looks exactly like Nathan Lane, whose name is Scabarus. And he's, he's like, my kinsman's sword. Guys, what is a kinsman's sword? I don't know. The sword that belongs to his kinsman. We never meet his kinsman. It's a really weird thing to keep insisting on. It's he not his really sword. really insists on it. It's yeah. his kinsman's sword. Okay. Well, I definitely love that there is uh, a balance to these things, like a universal balance, so that it isn't just coming out of thin air it's being taken from something else right and so. those people are going to miss it yeah. Gabri- for every problem Gabrielle is fixing she's creating new ones elsewhere they go into a tavern and she decides to continue her role and is like great I'll make everybody have free drinks by saying the drinks are on the house mm-hmm. she is literally stealing food and drink yeah. from this tavern like this is not okay this, this one was for yeah. that personal like yeah. yeah this one was just like this is not the greater good I can eat this food we know free. Gabrielle loves eating so yeah. it's getting the better of her right here nitpick she does not finish that food oh, whatsoever that plate looked pretty good <laughs> Uh, I was more coveting the kebabs and beer that Aphrodite was eating later. She does have a nice looking kebab. Oh man, that kebab. So beer starts dripping through the ceiling, basically. Right, because she says beer is on the house. The drinks are on the house, So it's like they're on the house. It's like a literal, yeah, literal. And like dribbling down. (laughs) Yep. I do like all of the like literalness yeah. of things. It's yeah. really clever. Yeah, it's and it's fun. like teaching Gabrielle that she has to be a better writer. Exactly. That she can't like depend on cliche. She has to be direct and specific in her word choice. Isn't it better to embellish like the action scene at the end there than what was actually happening? I guess it depends what as school far of writing, as writing? You, you're into. But yeah, like if you're just like, Z- what does she say? Zina like, enters in a blaze Zina of glory. A blaze of glory. That doesn't tell you anything. You don't know what's going on. You just kind of know like the vibe. Well, I feel like she would elaborate then. It's just the beginning of the statement. But in this case, she literally couldn't say that because then Xena would be in cinders, <laughs> as Ares points out. So now we meet the warlord who's... Right. has a deal with Ares about invading a valley. This warlord is named <laughs> Thelonious. His henchman is named Monk. <laughs> oh. Would you have rather he was named Melissa? <laughs> <laughs> Melissa is about as good as Thelonious and Monk. <laughs> he also has a very extreme costume. And in fact, I would say most of the secondary characters in this episode have very out there costumes. I think yeah. because this is a comedy, you have Scabarus, who's wearing this like Roman toga with like the little curls yeah. and looks like he's coming straight out of Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Worm. Hence Nathan Lane. Hence Nathan Lane. And then you have this warlord Thelonious who's like wearing a samurai helmet straight up. And it just it looks like a little kid made it out of cardboard. And the barbarians. And the barbarians who all look like Hagar the Horrible. Like every every single one. And yeah, coin just for the very fact that we have these guys in the episode. They're I mean, to be fair, they're very fun. Yeah. They're great. I yeah. love yeah. the main the bar- yeah. guy. Yeah. He he I, I would say that that uh, our our main warlord and our main barbarian are both really funny secondary characters. There are a lot of threads going on here, uh, as this is making clear. I feel like this is a good point to kind of like maybe just 
say the like plot and plan that Aries has for this episode. Just because I don't even know if I it, can. I, just, I I think that like it's important. <laughs> it's really to crazy. be like this is what it is. This is what's yeah. happening. the deal. Like so, Aries has this army. They want to loot a valley. Yeah. And they can't loot the valley because they don't want to go up against Xena, who is in the valley. So in order to get rid of Xena from the valley, Aries at the beginning of the episode said all that stuff to Aphrodite to make Aphrodite jealous of Zeta, and her plan then was to enchant Gabrielle's scroll, in which case that would lead to somehow Zena leaving the valley. <laughs> yeah, and Gabrielle herself probably being in some kind of danger. Right. Uh, I so do like that that's the... That's the crux of it. The subtext here is that Ares does not want to have to deal with Xena himself. Mm. He brings in Aphrodite mm-hmm. to kind of do it for him. And I think that maybe gives you a hint as to kind of where he and Xena stand around now. Like, he's less into his ties that bind and reckoning style, like manipulative games. And he's more just like, I can't get through to her. I need somebody else to do it for me. And he chooses the world's most prudent warlord as his goon for the episode. Like, the fact that this guy was like, yo, Ares, I know you're the god of war, but I ain't going up against Xena. Like, I'm not stupid. Thelonious is a smart dude, <laughs> and props to him. Unlike, oh, whatever his name was, Agathon yeah. from Dirty Six. I like, oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> this guy should be Ares' new favorite, because Thelonious at least knows what's up. Yeah, so they spend a lot of this episode waiting for a signal from Ares to attack the valley. I love all the cuts to them waiting for the yeah. signal. Yeah, we, we have a lot of cuts to the bar barbarians we have a lot of cuts to the warlords like i do love that this episode kind of likes to check in with its subplots in this cheeky way yeah you know you don't really care about this but we promise you the more you see this the funnier it's gonna get and it's true it's true and it also adds i think because they're really quick scenes so this episode feels very fast-paced in that in that way because you have all this stuff going on it keeps checking in with all these different places it's always funny it just feels really fast uh, yeah. I would remind you that this is Bader and Merrifield who did Been There, Done That, mm-hmm. which also had, I mean, obviously a very different structure, but it was fast. Yeah, like You would fast. cut to these little beats. You would have just like a person reacting in a shot, and yeah. that would be the scene. Uh, and yeah, I, I think you're seeing some of that similar sense of humor here, where you can like cut to the warlord still waiting and be like, ha 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 ha, that's great. <laughs> In the same way that you could cut to Joxer and Gabrielle reacting to Xena things with the eggs in their lap. Mm-hmm. And like, that would be funny. I think this fast cutting is expressed really well in the scene where the barbarians show up at the tavern and Gabrielle has to write them away. So she first sends them yes. west and you see them kind of like go west. Yeah, and the shot, like yeah. this like, wide shot. You have this like, dramatic sky with these like red and black clouds, mm-hmm. and it's kind of beautiful. Yeah. And you hear their like voiceovers being like, oh, we're going west. <laughs> yeah. And then someone at the tavern is like, west? But that's where the Sisters of Guy Orphanage is. Oh, no. So she's like, uh, east. And then someone's like, but that's where Akinesha is. <laughs> and they're like, OK, um, she writes them out disappear from the land then they become pirates yeah we will I, and the way the guy delivers that we will become pirates yeah like, just like what the fuck great, okay like actor here like, yeah, he's great. Yeah. he gives really it a funny. lot of irony but at the same time he just sells it 100 yeah so good yeah because like you know you can be hit or miss with your extra characters and well he's like a, really yeah he, he definitely yeah. you know auditioned with this stuff so that's really great um and also i love the tavern owner too how he was like the food is free and the drinks are on the house. Like <laughs> nobody wants like it's like they don't want to be saying these no, things. No, yeah, you like, feel that. You feel that yeah. it's coming out against their will and they're kind of yeah. reacting to it as it leaves their lips being like, the fuck? What yeah, this is I actually very this? sinister. It yeah. is. I mean it's like that Gabrielle is like imposing her will on other uh-huh. people. Like this is scary. Yeah. Maybe this does belong in the middle of the rift. <laughs> Just putting it out there. <laughs> 
So she decides to send these barbarians to the caves where they would go to sleep. So this you see the them. location that we need. Yeah, for the, rest of the, the caves and uh, the barbarians like getting tired. Mm-hmm. So they go to the caves. Meanwhile, Aphrodite is just laughing it up. There's all these shots of her just totally just gleeful about yeah. everything that's happening, which I love because she often sets up these scenarios that are completely ridiculous and then takes a lot of hilarity in it for herself. <laughs> yeah, and you feel this is taking Leaf out of the classical playbook mm-hmm. that she sets up these scenarios just for her own amusement. Mm-hmm. That's what gods get to do. Mm-hmm. Gabrielle sees all the chaos she's created and she vows not to write another word, which is exactly what Aphrodite wanted from her. Exactly. So finally, like we see why this particular enchantment. But then Jaxer's like, maybe you should just edit your work. <laughs> That's a good point. Everybody's a critic. <laughs> but she kind of agrees with him in the end. She's like, yeah. you're right. I should just be more clear about like my aims. Like I should be ending hunger, disease, and war. Those are the three things she's just going to like write out of existence. So what does she do? She's like, okay, there's no more war. Write it down. War lost its power. And Ares just comes plummeting out of the sky. <laughs> Great. Just funny. I guess, I mean, Olympus is in the sky. So if yeah. you're kicked out, you fall down. I like it. I like, like it. It was uh, it was lovably literal. You're just like... But so, like, the whole thing is. Yeah. And so yeah. she's like, oh, That's shit. True. That's this episode. Everything's yeah. literal. Yeah, so she's like, oh, shit. And then the force that enchanted the scroll lost its power. So here comes Aphrodite, Aphrodite. plummeting from the sky. She lands on top of Ares. Yes, this is where we get it's our... Good- our good little shippy moment there between them. Meanwhile, Joxer is still puzzling over the awoke with a jerk gag. He still doesn't get it. We'll check back in with him later and see how he's doing with that. Yeah, will he get it? <laughs> Who knows? Gabriel needs to write Xena back into the story. That's what everybody has come to the conclusion. Obviously. <laughs> this episode does not have enough Xena. I know. Everyone's noticed. Yeah. So she starts with a woman with black hair in leather and she wants to write in with the chakra but Joxer points out what, what is a Does chakra? Does the scroll know what a chakra yeah. is? Which is uh, a little bit I of a really stretch. I really hope the scroll would just know but okay. So she's like, I mean okay. I think this is actually a really good allegory for the difficulties in writing something by committee you know when you have five different voices being like write this write that write that which I mean might be a Hollywood writer's room. <laughs> I was about <laughs> to say. Yeah. Like things can turn out not how you want, how anybody, any of those voices wants them to. And that's exactly what happens here. Is Jaxer Rob in this situation? <laughs> <laughs> what is the show? <laughs> and then all the fish later. <laughs> I, yeah, isn't Zeta Rob? <laughs> Except she never really helps with the writing. Yeah, I know. No. Yeah. She's got black hair. She's wearing leather. Carrying the whip of Zena. It's Minya. It's obviously made gonna be Minya. It's yeah. such a like the whip of Zena. It's such a tortured explanation for why Minya is gonna show up. Like yeah. it's so like okay, guys, you could have just written Zena. Surely this is what I was gonna ask you next. Like I am wondering if this was just something personal that I missed, but like if she just wrote Zena comes literally to me, Gabrielle. Like, she can't do that for what did he... That should have worked. But, you know, this episode, you know, because of the way it's structured, you kind of have to take it at face value that she's just, for whatever reason, writing these metaphorical versions of that. Well, we know she's extra like that, so... Yeah, she just hasn't figured out, like, a clear and precise way of being, like, Xena's back in this story. Mm -hmm. Which is the ultimate like stretch for this episode yeah. because clearly the entire plot would not happen if she just the second thing she wrote was Xena Xena wrote was into here. what what's the name of my town this town yeah wrote up to the town square stood here next to me Gabrielle but no <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. well but now Minya is here and Minya is fabulous yeah, Love I Minya. mean, I, I forgive it for all these weird contortions because, mm-hmm. like, they got Minya into the story and it's great to see her still dressed up in her kind of Barbarella-style xena esque garb. And she fangirls Ares and Aphrodite, which was great. She does, yeah. I guess she still is. We talked about her in Day in the Life as being a stand-in for fandom. I think that that's still true of her. Mm-hmm. 
especially with the never heard of you, Bob, to oh, Jackson. Oh, to Jackson, <laughs> of course. Poor Jackson. So they go back to the tavern next. Am I right in saying Yeah, that? this is the delicious kebab. <laughs> Aphrodite does what we would all would do if we were su- suddenly mortal. She gets super drunk. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is what so Ares, did. Ares did. Yeah, in Ten Little Warlords. So yeah. like, this is her turn. You feel like Ares this episode has more of a grip on mortality because he's he gone through it before. It, yeah. But Aphrodite, it's just like such a wake up call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God experiencing mortality is always a, a great thing. Nathan Lane shows up. <laughs> yes. Yes. Demanding his kinsman's sword. As he does. So Gabrielle does the only thing she could think to do, which is sends him to the Send him to, to the, the game. Send him to the game. <laughs> Cause some trouble. Go to the game. I know. I love it's that. It's like the Siberian gulag <laughs> of this episode. I think it's really funny that that's her go-to. Yeah. Can't think of anything else to do with you. So, okay. She's also having some kind of insecurity about her writing because all she's able to do is cause problems. And this is the moment where Joxer, while wearing his like, what do you call those things? The beer thing. The beer yeah, hat. He, he created a, the, the beer, beer helmet. helmet. Yeah. yeah, the two beers on either side of the helmet with the straws. Yeah. 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 I thought it was cute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I really love this moment that he praises yeah. her writing. Yeah. This is an episode mm-hmm. about Gabrielle's writing. For the most part, causes a lot of problems and we're kind of being asked to laugh at what a bad writer she is because she can't just write Xena rides back into town. Yep. <laughs> like, but he says her stories are beautiful. Yeah. And that they do a lot of good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I think is what she wants to hear. And then he asks Aphrodite for some love advice for a friend. <laughs> So my friend likes this other person, but she doesn't like him back. What should he, I mean, I, I mean, he do. (laughs) And she kind of like tells him to write some poetry. And then if that doesn't work, get her a present. And she makes it very clear that that's her stock answer for everyone. Of course. She is not going out of her way to help Joxer. No. So Joxer, like a truly impressed Gabrielle, even though she does like receiving the present later. But, and she likes yeah. writing. Like these mm-hmm. actually are pretty good suggestions for yeah. guests. Of course, she is impressed by poetry later in the program. Oh, uh. good point. And pre- it's a it's poetry and it's a present. Mm-hmm. So it's not a limerick. So mm-hmm. that's why somebody's she's been taking some advice from Aphrodite with oh, that one. <laughs> so Jackson, like a moron, writes his limerick on the magical scroll. Do you think he? Did that on purpose? Like, I didn't... No. You think he was just like, idiot. he wanted to write it? He just, you know, there was paper at hand. He was just like, yes, write it down. No, he obviously didn't want to conjure that into existence. He's so embarrassed by it. But then also, like, peeking at it through his fingers. So how embarrassed is he really? This is another one of those, like, nice guy moments where I'm like, Joxer, you were almost a good one. And then you're like, oh, the woman I love. Like, naked for all to see. Oh, 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 I'm into it. And you're like, no, consent. Jesus, dude. So, yeah. There are three naked go-go dancer Gabrielles. Three of them in the shot when you can see jocks are very clearly not, not Gabby. Yeah. Gab. <laughs> they saved on those But effects. that's fine. Yeah. It's fine. We get the intent. And then when we do have the close-ups of Renee doing yeah. the go-go dancing, it's very funny. It's so funny. She's being very adorable in the face area. <laughs> I, I think that the, the best part, besides the go-go music that happens... Uh, is the like noises she makes? Yeah. <laughs> Which later they use those like that sound effect for like when it's like wide shots of them running around. So it's really funny. Yeah. And, yeah. What is the noise? I'm, I don't. It's just funny like Gabrielle noises. Yeah. <laughs> Can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Very specific. Why go go dancing? It's why not, not limerick. Go go dancing. Yeah. Why not? That's the. That that my other question about the limerick is how was it supposed to end? Is it dirty? And I'm just not understanding the dirt. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be dirty, yeah. Yeah. What's the dirty? Like, I don't know. I didn't get it. I'm too innocent to understand this gag. Do you have the... No, all I have is love's eyes. Yeah, me too. And three times the... I don't know what ends in ID. And I'm like, what is it? Oh, God, what is it? What part of the female anatomy was (laughs) was supposed to be here? I don't know. Somebody will tell us. Yeah. He he decides to send those three to the caves. (laughs) 
And then we have a really like, I don't know, I thought it was an unnecessary and annoying shot of Aries being like, yes, he's checking hypnotized them out. by their naked hotness. This episode has an agenda with Aries and Gabrielle. Like, yeah, it's noticeable. <laughs> Uh, we'll talk about it some more later. Okay, put a pin in yeah. that. So since the poetry didn't work, he decides to get the present, and the only, you know, thing he can do is trade with this peddler, that guy who appears in Hercules, and here uh, I see a what coin. Is, what's the name of this character? I I think he's a different character here. I think oh. he's just peddler here. Okay, but. Previously, he was, what was it? Falafel? Falafel. Yeah. And whatever he is on Hercules. On Hercules. I don't, I, I don't even want to touch that. <laughs> Why? He looks like Borat. Yeah, he, he does. He sure looked does. a lot like Sasha Baron Cohen's yeah. nephew or something. <laughs> it's just going to keep throwing coins it's, in. It's problematic that he looks like <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen. I don't know. It's Borat. <laughs> Mentioning Borat feels faintly problematic. So I'm just going to keep throwing okay. coins in. Okay. Um, and he trades his father's scabbard for this present. Which he then puts on her chest as she's sleeping. And she wakes up and it's this like nice turquoise necklace. This definitely felt about. like, you know, that, that, that old Henry story about mm. the old couple who are buying each other presents. And I don't exactly remember what they are, but it's like, you know, the husband trades his like egg dish and like the wife trades her like cardigan. But then like the gifts they buy for each other, it's like, pearls to go with your cardigan and oh. like a beautiful egg to go in your egg dish so oh, no yeah this reminded me of that i was like no don't trade your scabbard well if he didn't spend all his dinars buying expensive boots and like maybe he'd have jet outfit for... he wouldn't yeah. have had wasn't this. there a good ted quote ted Raimi quote about this moment where yes. he trades the scabbard Ted says, it's a very touching scene. I've got to say, it's a pivotal moment in the show because Joxer wants to be the greatest warrior in the world, but he's giving that up to be with her. Yeah, it is a big symbolic moment to trade away, not just a scabbard, but the scabbard that his father, yeah. this great warlord, gave him. It's interesting that, I mean, he still has the sword. Yeah. So, but maybe that's not a family heirloom. That doesn't really yeah, but like he's giving up him. being a warrior via scabbard. Like that's weird. <laughs> well, the scabbard it's is symbolic. The, yeah, it's the one thing I assume on his costume that actually does have sentimental value for warlording. It's not made out of pasta strainer. <laughs> it's like an actual badass scabbard. Well, Gabrielle is very surprised at the gift she receives. Yeah, she wakes up with a jerk. Again, again, yeah, he gets a gift. Uh, oh, and gets, gets a, a gift. And gets a gift from him. <laughs> we didn't talk about it, but the um the panning shot of everybody asleep was very cute. I did love that, yeah. Minya, right. um Aphrodite snoring. Yeah, yeah. she's Minya like there. There. Aries snoring. kind of curled up there and Minya sleeping and Gabrielle sleeping and it's like this one big happy family moment. Yeah. I felt that in the tavern too. Everybody kind of being hanging out, being a bit domestic. Mm -hmm. Like it's nice to see an episode where these secondary characters are all just kind of enjoying each other's company. Yeah. Well, I know Zena's not here yet, but let's take this opportunity um, of talking about that shot of all of them to choose, to say that I feel like this is the best of the best of the cast of this show is all in this episode. Might be why I love this this one so much. This is Xena All Stars. Yeah, it mm -hmm. feels like an All Stars to me. Minya, Ares, yeah. Aphrodite, Aphrodite, and Joxer, who I love, <laughs> and Flawful. <laughs> he's no, not he's, just, he's not he part leaves. of this. <laughs> He's just <laughs> part of it. Yeah. But yeah, I agree that like yeah. obviously like everybody loves Minya from Day in the Life. Like so much fun. It's great to see her back. Having Ares and Aphrodite together is a joy. Yes. It doesn't happen that frequently. And they're the best gods. They are absolutely the best gods. And it's a lot of fun to see them in comedy episodes, kind of with the wind out of their sails. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, is them the, at their best. And the fact that this is all characters that you know already mm -hmm. is another bonus. Yeah, and probably think, why we like this episode so much. Yeah. Because, it adds to that happy family yeah. vibe. Everybody like enjoys 
being there, even if they complain about it. You get the sense of it's like, well, let's curl up in a puppy pile under the stars, <laughs> and that's not weird. Like, even though that should be weird for most of these people, <laughs> yeah. they're just going with it. Yeah. But anyway, we were discussing how Jocks are Gabe Gabriel, <laughs> <laughs> um, that present. Um, and it's I like the way he apologizes by saying that, like, he wanted to make up for the three naked yous. <laughs> the three naked yous. Yeah. That's a good phrase. It's a good band name. I'm Livy of the Three Naked Yous. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and he had to, like, you know, shoehorn in the fact that he traded his very precious scabbard for this, so she better appreciate it. Mm-mm. And she loses her mind about this. She just freaks <laughs> out that he traded his very precious scabbard because, as it turns out, I put the diamond in the coat and I put <laughs> the coat out here! here. <laughs> Honestly, like, why would she put it there? <laughs> Gabrielle. It's the dumbest place to hide something on a, one of Joxer's things. Yeah. Like, that's well, a good hiding place. He said he would never part with it. I don't care. He's Doesn't Joxer. she have a bag that she would never yeah. part with as well? Like, one that she keeps her, I don't know, scrolls in? Like, <laughs> right. I oh. just, no way. If, like, the biggest idiot in the world came up to you and, like, said, see this MacBook? This is my most treasured possession. It wouldn't mean I'd like put my, you know, tax documents on that computer because it's <laughs> safe. Like that's not how it works. So this girl is gone. Yes. And Meanwhile, Aphrodite smells really bad. Right. Uh, negative points for this. You didn't like this one, I Europe? didn't like it whatsoever. I mean, I definitely felt bad for her that she's wearing like no clothes. And just like living rough. Why does she smell so bad so quickly? That's true. Yeah. Nobody smells bad. And nobody, nobody smells was bad. smelling bad. Nobody else is yeah. Like, no bath. one was like, wow, Aries, you stink. Like, he's a man. He would smell worse than her in general. Well, that's man stink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the joke is that she's so, like, pretty and awesome and, like, would never be filthy. And, like, here she is, for right. some reason, just absolutely disgusting. <laughs> Okay, I'll give it to you. I, I, I laughed at it because it's, you know, it feels like Aphrodite's version of that same brought low. You know, the fact that suddenly all the things that come so easily to her, her beauty. Vanity. Yeah, like suddenly you have to work for them because that's actually how those things work right. in the real world. Yeah, but, but like if they said she smelled bad once, that's okay. Maybe. But the fact just, that it became the only joke. She smells very Really bad. bad. Yeah, she's like, you know... I do like that, that later, yeah. though, it's, like, not actually her. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's oh, a joke about yeah. that. We'll get there. We'll, yeah. get, there. we'll get there. Okay. Um, well, Peddler definitely figures out that he just found a credit card and uses it. And that's where he makes the dinars fall from the sky. I would have liked to see that. Yeah. They probably didn't have the budget to make dinars rain from the heavens. Of course not. But I would have liked to see the collateral damage of like people getting killed by coins flying from the heavens. Or just, you know, mobbing it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's a good point. So Gabrielle kind of takes charge of this situation. She delegates. She says that... I forget where she's actually sending Aphrodite into town to find out... Where the peddler went? I guess so, But meanwhile, yeah. she and Ares are tracking the peddler. Mm-hmm. And she sends Joxer to the caves. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's been demoted out of the episode. He has to go away. Well, let's start with this Ares and Gabrielle scene. Let's do it. It was good. I loved it. <laughs> so they're tracking, right? Yeah, she sees these like cart tracks mm-hmm. in the road and was like, oh, these are these are deep as if this cart was heavy, like filled with dinars. He's going that way. And he's like, those are some mad good tracking skills. Where'd you get those from? Sina? And she's like, yeah, Sina. And then they bond over Sina. Yeah, they're like, don't you just love how like Zena smells? And like, don't <laughs> well, you Zina like how good Zena is at fights? And they're just like, yeah, she's so good. Um. He says he taught <laughs> Zena how to focus. Oh, yeah. He gave her a purpose. In a focusy way. <laughs> but as Gabrielle says, she has a different purpose now. 
I do love that they have he accepts that here yeah that's important to say that he doesn't quibble he doesn't go like no she can so easily go back to like being the head of an army my army he's just like yep yep that's true that's true she does her own thing now he's he's kind of grown into the state of acceptance where he's Mm -hmm. like Zita has become this different person and I'm just kind of here yeah so I do like that they have this chemistry slash tension in this scene but it's really all based on how they love Xena and they think she's pretty and awesome you can't help but notice that something doesn't come up between them which is a thing that we don't know about yet because we haven't gotten to forget me not but it's already happened in the chronology of the show that's which true is that Gabrielle had a problem and Aries helped her out so they have a connection that we are, as yet don't know about so why the heck are you talking about it, guys? Well, I'm just saying that I feel like that's it's kind of here in this moment where they're they have common ground. You know, they're seeing each other as people in a way that I don't, they if you're before. watching this episode for the first time, you're certainly not thinking of a future scene in a future episode. No, to be but if you, if you know about that scene and you go back to this, you go, oh, these guys do have things in common. Like they've already kind of seen their common ground. I think they see their common ground, and it's shaped like Lucy Lawless. <laughs> Everybody's common ground is shaped like Lucy Lawless. Let's yeah. be real. True. Uh, but the, I, I like their exchange at the end of the scene. is really great because they, like, acknowledge. Like, you feel the weirdness as an audience yeah. member, and then they, too, feel it as well and are like, you know, are we starting to warm up to each other? Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, me neither. No, all right. Kevin okay. Smith, I think, really kills at that moment where he's yeah. like, I don't like it. Like, it's, okay. it's really just perfect delivery. It's mm-hmm. so funny. Mm-hmm. And it just, like, kind of dispels the tension while also adding to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they're sick. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, you know what? In some ways, I dig it more than Aries, Zena. I got to say. Uh, what I, I hate to say it, but I will say it. I oh. will second this. Oh, I, I know that we, I know that we. I just was like, stop talking about forget me not. But that was the episode where I was like, you know what? I really like this dynamic. I mean, I think it's interesting. Me yeah. personally, it's literally because it's not, not a, Zena and Aries. I like it, and therefore it's the never going to happen. But Aries not as a ship. and Zena are both alpha dogs. Not, well, and for me, when they're together, it's such a like jockeying for control. Yes. And I think Aries and Gabrielle, it's something different. And I think that immediately attracts me because it, it's harder to right. categorize what that attraction is, but it's totally there. Mm-hmm. You see it. Yeah. yeah. And they also have a very fascinating relationship throughout the series, too. Yeah. So A plus there. Long ago, we talked about Aries as being kind of warped by the responsibility of his godhood. Like maybe he started out being something else. But, like, having to, like, be that guy on Mount Olympus, like, with people's lives in his hands made him this kind of awful dude. So I wonder if that's almost what connects them, is, like, they're both the product of their experiences and the, the things that have happened to them. Hmm. I don't know. That's well, cer- certainly Gabrielle would be the one who would get sort of, like, his backstory out of him. I mean, he is a damaged warrior in a He is. Sense. He's totally her type. Uh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Like I said, because he's so much like Zena. Yeah. Well, he shoves her into that cave. (laughs) Yeah. Let's talk about the cave. Go first. Uh, Yeah, there's this like sequence in the cave. It reminded me a bit of Comedy of Eros, where you had like the hallway with all the doors and the couples running in and out of the doors. Here you have the scroll getting passed off from person to person, from the peddler to Gabrielle to Joxer, to Scabarus. Nathan Lane. Excuse me, to Nathan (laughs) Lane. Like, yeah, you just have this kind of, like, relay race that happens. And I feel like the music went a little klezmery at points. (laughs) Like, that's how crazy it was, yeah. It was some very wacky music. Yeah. And, of course, the three dancing gabs are their gabses. Yeah. I don't know how to pluralize that. Gabs. And my favorite bit with that is when Joxer enters this like central area in the cave with three exits and you have a dancing Gabs in each one. Oh, yeah. And it felt a bit like a horror movie. Like, are these like weird, threatening dancing silhouettes coming closer (laughs) and closer? And he's all like, yeah, but also, ah. They're passing the squirrel off at times, kind of like football like a football match which 
I not realize matches with the ending of this episode. Oh, uh, yeah. The sports broadcasting. Oh, good point. Yeah, a lot of sportiness going on in this episode. There's this moment at the end when I forget the lot. What do we have? We have the peddler running. Wait, he has the scroll. I have a question. Like, why is he in the cave? I think place. I don't know. I mean, yeah, well, that's a great. Question. Was he going after the scroll? No, I mean, he, yeah, had he had the scroll. He just went there on his own. Oh, he was like, I'm going to hide there. Like, Maybe it's the one place in town where you can hide out if everyone's <laughs> after you. Not yeah, he just why turns he up there. Yeah. Um, everybody else has been sent there, including the barbarians who are beginning to wake up because there are like a thousand people in their caves now. <laughs> <laughs> So you end up with the peddler has the scroll, but I think in the interim, Gabrielle got it back for like a second and wrote something down that basically sends the scrolls to Zena. Mm. That's her like way out of the situation. It's like if I don't, I can't figure out the appropriate combination of words to bring Zena to me. So I'm just gonna bring this to Zena. So she sends the peddler off with the scroll. He's chased by. The barbarians mm -hmm. who are chased by Scabarus, who is chased by the three Gabzes, mm -hmm. who's chased by Minya. Yes. And the goons take this as a sign that it's time to attack the valley. <laughs> yes. If that's not a sign from Ares, I don't know what is. <laughs> Good line. What's that smell, guys? Is it Aphrodite? Oh, no. gee. <laughs> Aphrodite thinks she smells like fish for a second. But no, it's Xena with the world's biggest cart of fish. It's insanely This is Rob fish. Tappert's like greatest dream. Just this is just their fishing? house. Yeah. <laughs> just nothing but fish. Just fish everywhere. It's so Lucy like poor Zena. Carting this fish. Yeah. That's poor Zena dream. like was just like fishing. Yeah. Like compulsively. Compulsively fishing. And then all of a sudden starts getting sent to various people who has who she has had strong emotional connections with throughout her life. Yeah, that is what she has been up to. So because of Gabrielle's attempts to get her to come back. This is like a span of two days, right? Yeah. So clearly they have just not traveled anywhere in their circle around Amphipolis and Potidea because mm -hmm. oh, she's able point. to yeah to go see all everyone these places and, and like do back. all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, she goes to visit first her number one friend, which, mm -hmm. which turns out to be her first friend from when she was five. I had first thought this was Flora. Yeah, from the back second wall. black oh wall. Like, <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if she was like, and then I threw her down from a tree <laughs> for old times' sake. And then she goes and sees my fave Cyrene. Mm -hmm. This one was really tortured. Rejoins the woman who brought her to a new light. Mm -hmm. Why on earth did Gabs think that would describe her? It sounds like Cyrene took one look at that cart of fish and was just like, okay, bye, honey. <laughs> Thanks really? for stopping by. <laughs> she reads the scroll, right? Yeah, she reads the scroll and understands exactly what has happened. There's some good stuff in this part in terms of Xena Gabrielle because Lucy delivers the line about how she's like, I basically like went to meet every person I've ever like had an emotional connection with in my entire life except you. And there's like this great pause and like they smile at each other like goofballs and I hate it. Oh my God. And it's also great that, you know, Gabrielle has kind of been given like unlimited power over people but like Xena in the end returns because she wants to mm -hmm. because she loves Gabs yeah and she figures and it out like I she needs to go back this is what's happening and so I'm, I like that yeah. that Gabrielle couldn't compel Xena to come back Xena did it of her own free will because mm -hmm. she loves Gabs yeah she also makes a great face when she says three naked Gabrielles <laughs> yes <laughs> there's some good face exchange right there She's really not that confused by it. She seems more confused by the possibility that Gabrielle wrote that naughty limerick. Yeah, <laughs> she sure does. And then when she finds out it's Jocester, she's like, oh yeah, that fits. So she wants to know what the exact words for the spell were, and they were, lies will make the world go round till truer words are written down. So she's like, oh, we must write the truth. And only but the truth. <laughs> Wait, that's not... The truth and nothing but the truth. Yes. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> and Gabrielle is like, 
Oh, I'm not good at writing action. <laughs> this is great. This is a bombshell, you guys. That was a great thing for her to say, and Aries reacts so great to that. Just like, what? <laughs> You're following Xena. Yeah. How can you not write action? And she does action herself, which I think would make her well suited to being like, okay, faint, then punch, then like jump. Like she knows how these things work. It's not like me trying to write action where I'm just like, yeah, and then he like, Whoa, and then they're like, Whoa. is Stallone sing this one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she says she loves to use metaphors, which we totally know. She's like a fancy bitch. It's yeah. all like she keeps rejecting various turns of phrase for not being literary enough. <laughs> This girl is such an asshole about <laughs> her writing. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, that's where she tries with the uh, Blaze of Glory, and then he's like, uh, no, she's going to be in Cinders. So now Xena takes on the Warlords, all by her lonesome. And Joxer takes on the narration of what Gabrielle should... He's the sports commentator. Right yep, and it's pretty awesome. This is a repeat in some ways of the big famous scene from Altered States where Xena fought off some dudes with fish that scream yeah. screaming fish I actually don't remember if they screamed when back does then. the crustacean lobster situation that happen? was with Callisto <laughs> shit well not with Callisto the it clams. was Callisto playing Xena it was 10 little warlords yeah okay. Um, yeah, I made the gif. That's why I, like, I have like the sense memory. I'm like, remember Kalisa face in there. But yeah, so I feel like Xena did this long ago. Baby time frolics just with like three fish on a rope and that was it. <laughs> this time it's just like an all out fish brawl. <laughs> and not just fish. We've got the octopus. We've got the starfish. Yeah. We've got the eel who's kind of wrapped around itself like an Ouroboros to be a chakram. But so is the, sh the starfish is also a chakram. Right. The starfish is also a chakram. And they all she scream. A, she has a lot of chakras. Yeah. And the swordfish. The ultimate. The ultimate. Who screams, <laughs> oh, oh no! no! <laughs> I mean, this is some silly shit, you guys. But... I love it. I don't even care. This is a huge revelation that fish can speak in the Xenoverse. <laughs> they speak well, English or maybe Greek. We have an entire follow-up of fish lives in That's true. Fish We're going to get to the bottom so. of why fish can speak eventually <laughs> in the Xenoverse. That's true. That's a really good point. All will be answered eventually. <laughs> so Jaxer is doing a really good job, I would say, yeah. of commenting. Mm-hmm giving the like facts you want to know. He can tell you what kind of fish she's using yes. at what point. My favorite is his pun about she must have thrown that in just for the halibut. Oh no. Bad puns. <laughs> That's almost as good as woke up with a jerk. Which he just gets like Which right now. Which he gets now. in the middle yeah. of this comment. I like that there's payoff yeah. and I like that he figures it out. He finally figures it out and he's offended as he should be. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the spell starts dissolving. Also you have Aries complaining because he claims that the octopus is a squid which is a reference to the fandom debate about whether the squid that gabrielle eats in lost mariner is actually an octopus right oh fandom debates oh my gosh All <laughs> that, right. you know th those are simpler days when that's yeah. what you fight about is octopus or for squid for sure oh. for Didi and aries get their powers back yes I, well, I before we move on, I love Minya watching Xena fight, saying that her hormones are peaking. It's true. I did not get that until and just that she's now. ready to crack some heads. Yes, you're right. She is inspired by Xena. But yeah. then she makes out with Joxer. But only because yeah. well, Aphrodite enchanted them against their will. It was kind of skeezy. Aries Joxer. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Harry's jocks are just like, I want the fake. I three. want the fake. <laughs> so Minya decides to run off to find Hower because of her hormones. Ra her hormones suddenly are raging. Do hormones do that? Do you just like see Lucy Lawless fight and go like, oh my yes. God. Yes. Well, she runs off because of Aries. That's right. I gotta right. quote this line because But it seems a good like one. she's more. Yeah, but yeah, let's hear the line. Wait, when well, she's, she's just, you know, she's talking about how like. Oh, you know, I had all these opinions about the gods and stuff, but like she just sees him as a man now because of the everything they just went through. But then she's, she's like, kind of the arc of 
us watching the show. He started out a god, and now he's a man. Okay. He's just a character who we like. I don't know. He started off with, like, a dude in a cloak yeah. with a painted-on beard. Yeah. And he still has <laughs> one. I love Aries. You can all shut up. I'm sorry, Katie. Go, please go on. <laughs> Wait, her line is great. Just another big old leather-clad, well-muscled, gorgeous hunk of bad boy man. <laughs> Hunk of bad boy man (laughs) is quite a phrase. (laughs) Yeah. You guys know I always like this kind of character. I mean, I I warm up to him as he gets more and more kind of ground into the dirt. Yeah. Which he's he's halfway there now. Like he's he's definitely understanding that he can't change who Xena is. He's not taking himself as seriously at all. And and neither is Kevin Smith in his like performance, Mm -hmm. which is great. Uh, I, I have a lot of affection for him, but I guess I do sort of prefer shipping him with gas. <laughs> Same. You do you. <laughs> you guys do you. We do. I have many ships on this show. Speaking of Aries and Gabs, they have this final little scene, which gets very weird. <laughs> sure does. <laughs> but like not in a way that I want it to be. I like it. <laughs> These guys didn't want to do what everyone expects, which is... I think what was scripted. Yes. Scripted. They had tension in that previous scene that was clear. And then in the original script, it ended with Aries and Gab's kissing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so weird. They were like, nah. I can't imagine that. Like, I can't actually, Even though I say I ship it, I can't well, it imagine it actually happen. happen. So, yeah. yeah. So I at the end it's the my fan in, not my... Yeah. Canon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Something interesting to explore outside the realm of the actual show. Yeah. I would have bought it if they, at that moment, were also talking about Xena or something. Maybe if they were really drunk <laughs> and like sad. Talking about Xena? Crying, yeah. crying about Xena? Yeah. If they both felt rejected by Xena, I can see it happening. But just the fact that it's like, at the, oh, yeah, we both triumphed. Yay. Xena's here. Everything's yeah. great. Kiss? It didn't, not, like, no. none of this made sense. And honestly, sense. I didn't need another follow up because the way that it ended in the first scene was the end of this conversation where they went, we just had like a weird moment. That's true. Yeah, it does we have did. That and then they ended it. that. You're right. So they didn't even need to like reconnect they here. They just needed to do another you. weird moment because he loved the first one. So here's the second, even weirder one. Yeah. In any case, he boops her nose. <laughs> he does boop her nose. <laughs> I wish that he just booped her nose. Yeah. This if he like, just went up to her without boop. like the lines and was just like, boop. I would have loved that more. This was like that, like, oh, like, what's that? Like, underneath yeah. boop <laughs> yeah boop from below <laughs> having fun i don't know it's, it's supposed cute. to be like sibling yeah it felt that way it a felt yeah, really it like juvenile it was and sweet i liked it it's, it, 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 it was a, it, you know what it was hitting some stooge vibes for me oh I and see. that's why uh, I don't vera like can't it. do anything related like to stooges like okay fine fine so the final gag of the episode is everybody clustered around the scroll and they realize that there's a little space left. What is there room for for the end? So Gabrielle, well, as she's writing the end, is like complaining, being like, I personally think that sounds a bit, I don't know what, <laughs> some, some literary complaint, <laughs> some pretentious bullshit. And the episode ends on the bullshit. Yep. I love it. I don't Very care meta. that the scroll cute, is no cute longer little meta moment. enchanted. Yeah. yeah. So she's keeping this scroll. Like, they finished it. They finished it. She'll roll it up. I mean, it's a, it's a chronicle of one of Zena's adventures. She disappeared. She went fishing. A lot of crazy <laughs> shit happened. Then there was a fight with fish. Enchanted Great scroll. Zena adventure. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I guess you're supposed to imagine that actually if you rolled out the scroll, it would be like the screenplay for this episode. Like it covered everything that happened in it. So that's yeah. kind of the metal layer where she can write the end and like immediately you see executive producers, Raimi and Tappert. Fish. <laughs> This show, how many episodes feature fish? It must be like almost as many as feature Callisto. Yeah. Like it's maybe more. I think more. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> like, that's kind of unreal. But they have to eat. I mean, it's like they live off the land. They're yeah. either going to hunt or fish. Yeah. So they got to um, fish. I'm glad they fish. <laughs> of the two, I think fishing is a little sexier. So, okay. Yeah, especially the way Zena does it. Hunched like Gollum in the river. <laughs> Hot. So hot. <laughs> how, how'd she catch that starfish? Did she go snorkeling? Yes. Why was it there? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So many like varieties of fish and all swimming in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Anyway, this is Zena at its peak farce. <laughs> what? Barbarians. Okay. They went back to Barbaria though. Yeah. So it's fine. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. I like this episode. I love it. I think it's really, really delightful. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, Katie. It just feels like comedy all stars. Yeah, comedy all stars, like quotable, like lots of lines, lots, just super funny. And unlike um, King of Assassins from last week, and and also Warrior Priestess Tramp, I think this is a great outing for Doxer, which mm-hmm. I know isn't the way most fans judge episodes, but I I think it's important that here yeah. he's in character. You know, you have that thread of romance, but also he's still a dweeb. Like he's mm-hmm. he's great here. He's doing I, a lot I, of good work. I prefer this kind of Jaxer. Like he is innocuous in this one. Mm-hmm. He doesn't try to be like heroic or whatever. He's just doing like goofy stuff. Like I loved how he did shadow puppets. Oh yeah, that was a nice little detail. Tavern. This yeah. episode is full of adorable little details like that. Yeah. Okay. Andrew so, Merrifield did a great job with yeah. the directing. It's really great for all these yeah. characters. Yeah. 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 yeah, and he did a lot of that, like, you know, random kind of like aside wisdom, you know, like, oh, maybe Pitching you did your where work, no one's you wanted. Know, right. So. Yeah, I also like at the end where he's kind of gesturing at the scroll with a fish. It's kind of, <laughs> right. you know, these little details that just kind of are always so in character for everybody. So this was a good Jaxer yeah. episode. Sure. And <laughs> there's, you know, three naked Gabriels and... And Renee one O'Connor's one. abs are out yeah. of control, so apologies if I'm objectifying, but also, eh. <laughs> And you know what? It, it kind of reminds me a bit of uh, the Buffy episode, <laughs> Something Blue. Oh. Where Willow has control over other people's lives. I mean, it doesn't quite take the moral dimension where you feel like Gabrielle is like doing, like controlling people in a sinister way. Mm. But I like that you get to see Gabrielle in this position mm-hmm. where she like kind of has the ability to change the world and what does she do with it? Mm -hmm. Mostly make Xena fish. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Great. So this wraps it up. Yeah. And you can follow us on all the stuff. Yeah, the huge. (laughs) Uh, Come check us out on uh, xenawarriorpodcast.com. You can listen to all the episodes and uh, we are on Apple Podcasts where you can subscribe uh, and rate and leave reviews. Um, And then also on all the social medias, uh, Facebook uh, and Tumblr, Xena Warrior Podcast, and on Twitter at Xena Warrior Pod. Maternal instincts next week, guys. Uh It's different than this one. (laughs) (laughs) And now for something completely different. The power. The passion. The the podcast. podcast.